All right, today we're going to take a look at the colonial background and what's leading us post Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. So with the uh, colonial background, we're going to take a look at the colonial impulses. What is going on that's driving this impulse to colonize the New World? Well, there's a few things. First of all, let's take a look at uh, who, who's the major players. We're looking at England, France, Spain, and the Netherlands, which uh, typically we would refer to as the Dutch. And the colonial impulse really lasted from about 1500 to 1732. Notice uh, 1492 is when, we do, is when Christopher Columbus sailed across, across the ocean blue, discovered the Caribbeans. Of course, he thought it was India. That's why, we, uh, why he named the people he ran into Indians. But uh, it took a few years for the world to, uh, world to catch on, and, or I should say the European powers to catch on and discover that, hey, maybe we better get on board here. France has already beat us to the punch here. The other thing to keep in mind, France at this time is the world superpower, and uh, they remain the world superpower until the Spanish Armada is defeated in 15... Oh, I can't remember exactly when in the 1500s, but uh, between Mother Nature and... A lot of luck, uh, the English Navy was able to destroy r almost all of the Spanish uh, Navy at one time. And uh, uh, the Spain has never been a superpower since. They have never become a major player in world affairs after the Spanish Armada is destroyed. Very significant uh, event in European history. With that said, there's some things going on that's leading or that has helped spur on this colonial impulse. And the first thing, arguably, would be the end of the Crusades. Uh, 1491, the Spanish defeat the, the Muslim Moors and uh, send them back towards Turkey. Keep in mind, uh, the Crusades, uh, while they started out as being uh, quite noble, uh, they ended up with a bad reputation of being more about uh, wealth gathering and plundering but while there's some truth to that there's also some truth in there that the Muslim invasion into Europe was not going to stop unless some power was was to stop them their their goal was to conquer all of Europe and it was not until 1491 where they stopped in Spain that's how far north the Muslim civilization was able to conquer so at 14 uh, after 1491 that freed up a lot of interest or a lot of uh, focuses from trying to save Western civilization and Europe to other activities. The other thing that occurred during this time period was the Reformation. Up until 1517 when Martin Luther, a German monk, nailed his 95 thesis on the Wittenberg church's door in order to spark a debate in an effort to reform the Roman Catholic Church, reform it regarding uh, uh, several of its abuses, uh, that it was uh, exploiting the, the poor and the uneducated in some of its uh, religious practices, particularly in the area of indulgences. Uh, before this time period, you were either Roman Catholic or maybe Jewish or dead. You really didn't have an option. Um, you were forced to uh, practice Catholicism against your will and so you would often have people who are quote Christian and at that time you're only one version the Roman Catholic version or um, you, you didn't have such a good life and often would end up like I said executed so in 1517 Martin Luther uh, initiates a debate that ends up accumulating into what we call now call the Protestant Reformation Protestant, the root word there is protest, and Reformation is rebirth. And so we have a religious rebirth that occurs. The Catholic Church refused to reform itself at that time. They excommunicated Martin Luther, and his followers followed with him. And as a result, we have the Thirty Years' War that kills about, uh, about a million or more uh, Germans, mostly civilians, against the Protestants versus the Catholic Army. And uh, long story short, we now, in the Christian world, have thousands of Christian denominations. There's something like 5,000 denominations, Christian denominations, in, them, in America alone. So out of the Reformation, 
we now have the Bible in our own native language. Prior to the Reformation, if you were caught with a Bible in your native language, you'd be executed for it. And so a lot of people were actually had been executed for advocating the Bible being translated into the common language so the common person can read it. And that was just something the, the Roman Catholic Church could not tolerate and uh, would not allow to occur. And uh, it was actually Martin Luther that was the first one to write the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, in the English, excuse me, in the German language. And it is through the German language Bible that German was actually become, became codified as a written language. And, uh, and then from that, we have the English written Bible later down the road. But the Reformation was a major influence in this time period that is uh, uh, building this colonial impulse. So, of course, keep in mind, if the common person can read the Bible, now uh, that relationship with the deity that we would call Yahweh and with Christ uh, or Jesus, that becomes a very personal thing for individuals. And now individuals in their language can read it for themselves and come to terms with their own salvation um, as Martin Luther had seen it. We also have the Renaissance. Renaissance, its root word is birth, or again, rebirth. And so we're coming out of the dark ages, uh, and we're coming into this new explosive time period. We have huge advances in science, huge advances in art. Art and art methodology changes significantly, and we also have some incredible architecture that comes out, not only as part of of art, but it's also as part of engineering feats. And so it just, the, and we also get the classical music out of this time period that starts becoming developed. And so we have just a fundamental transformation culturally, artistically, and really, in, there's really nothing untouched in the European world uh, through the Renaissance. It's really just an incredible time period. And then we have this economic system called mercantilism, which we'll get to a little bit more uh, here in a couple more slides. But mercantilism is the ideal that uh, you would do whatever it took so that your mother country, if you're, if you're English, then your mother country would be England, so that England would become richer and more powerful for the behalf, for, on behalf of the king and queen. So everything you did was for that betterment. And so if for some reason, well, let me back up a little bit. So for under mercantilism, you would buy or get raw materials for your mother country. That's why you would colonize. You would transport those raw materials to the mother country where those raw materials would be uh, processed into finished goods. For example, if, it's, if you're going to buy a desk, that desk is made out of wood. That wood have to, would have to be harvested from trees. And so you'd come to North America, for example, harvest trees, ship those trees over to England where craftsmen would make the desk. And then that desk would be bought in England. And then if you were in, the, say, colonial North America, you would have it sent to colonial North, North America. And all of that money would stay within the realm of the British Empire. If you had to buy something from another country, say from France, let's say they, France had some really good smelling perfume or something that you wanted, then, uh, and if France was the only place you could buy it, there might be a trade deficit then, so you'd buy maybe, say, $10,000 worth of French perfume, then under mercantilism, you'd want France to buy $10,000 of something of yours. That way, it was an equal trade balance. The idea is that you would keep all of your money within your country. And I'll give you a good example. In China, we have some odd, we're our trading partner with China. We are in some odd billion, may, maybe even arguably trillion dollars worth of trade deficit between the United States and, and China. And you know this um, just by the mere fact if you go and look at what you buy, where it's made at, almost everything we purchase in America is made in China. And so China, on the other hand, doesn't need to buy a whole lot of stuff from us because they make it all in China. So we have a huge trade deficit. We need stuff from China, but China doesn't need so much from us. And so, they, so every time we buy something from China, made in China, then the, United, or the U.S. dollar is then transported or transferred to China, of which will never come back to America. It weakens the American dollar. It weakens us here in America while it strengthens China. 
Now, the flip side is, as far as the trade deficit goes, they have a lot of people to feed. So, like here in Idaho, we have a lot of produce, a lot of grains, a lot of wheat, a lot of corn, a lot of stuff like that, soybeans, that we'd like to sell. And China is hungry. So, that is one area that we actually do very well in, is exporting our grains to China where they need it to feed all their people. So, that's the trade deficit ideal. And in mercantilism, you would limit that as much as possible and buy everything from your mother country. We also have a centralization of power that's going on. Now, keep in mind, Europe was uh, not the way it is as we think of today, f uh, the country of France, the country of, of Spain, the country of, of uh, Belgium, and, and so forth. They were actually little kingdoms. So you had the kingdom of Normandy. Well, today, Normandy is part of France. We don't think of Normandy as being an uh, independent kingdom or the kingdom of Bulgaria in Germany today or, uh, or those kind of things. So uh, we, uh, we have, or the kingdom of Saxony, for example. We have little kingdoms back then. And what's happening is the stronger princes of these kingdoms begin to consolidate their power meaning they're going through and they're and these other smaller kingdoms are either voluntarily surrendering their sovereignty to the bigger power or they get defeated in some kind of armed conflict bottom line is you get france that finally develops with these different kingdoms coming together into one kingship you have spain you have uh, um, uh, switzerland uh, you don't have Germany yet. Germany doesn't become Germany for quite some time yet. Not until 18, I believe it's 1876, before the uh, German Empire is declared. So again, uh, just a recap here with the Catholic kings. The Muslims are expelled from Spain. It says 1492. It's actually 1491. And with money and time now available, the Spanish monarchs, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, begin to fund explorations in the process, and in the process, I should say, uh, create the first modern imperialistic state. Not saying that they wanted to do that, and I would even argue they probably didn't even have the concept at the time. But this, in fact, is what where the imperialistic state comes, uh, comes into existence. So several of the early so-called conquistadors carried out crusades, not in the old world, because again, the old world, that's the crusades are over, but they went to the new world in search of riches and fame, uh, where wealth was very plentiful, and secondary purposes for going to the new world, particularly for the Spanish conquistadors, was under the guise of conversion of the native people. Certainly in the writings of Christopher Columbus and in the writings of uh, Queen Isabella, that is certainly a, a, uh, a concern for Queen Isabella. She really wanted, she felt this drive to convert, um, uh, to spread the gospel, if you will, to the natives who had never heard, heard the gospel of Christ uh, as the Catholic Church would want them to. So her, her purpose certainly was for religious purposes, uh, and um, let's not forget, certainly the king is thinking, uh, hey, we could become even more powerful and rich, and the conquistadors would get a percentage of what they were able to find as well. So that's what's happening there. So as you see here, Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabel began to fund explorations. Now it's interesting to note, Christopher Columbus did approach the king and queen of Spain, as well as a couple of other monarchs, uh, at the time, uh, in about 1490, 1491, and they said no because they were spending all their time and money fighting the Moors. So once that war ended, though, that freed up time and money, and King and Queen uh, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, jumped on the opportunity before any other uh, monarch could in, in the hopes that if, in fact, Christopher Columbus was correct, that the earth was not flat and that he could sail across the Atlantic Ocean and find another route to uh, the Indies. Now keep in mind, when the, war, when the the Moors, the Muslims down there, along the Silk Trade Route, they closed that route. The Europeans could not get to the trade routes or get into the trade routes to the Indies because the, the Muslims closed it off. They would be killed if they went down there. So they had to find another route. And he believed that the earth was not flat, which was common belief back then. And many people thought, in fact, he had a tough time getting a crew together and because they were like, we're not going to 
go off the edge of the earth. And many people thought when they seen him sail off, they, that's the last time they were going to see him. They were quite surprised when he came back months later with the evidence that he had found um, a new world. Now, keep in mind, he wasn't aware that it was a new world at the time. Um, they, he certainly did think he found India. So again, the first modern imperialistic state, conquistadors carried out the crusades to the new world. Uh, and then the conversions of the native people. So we're going to take a look at some of the Spanish contributions. Now again, this is a truncated class, so I can't go into the details. We could spend a couple weeks just in the ex early explorers and a week or two just in the, in the Spanish explorers. But we're gonna, we are going to focus on what we now call the United States. Uh, at that time, it's called North America. And uh, when the British take over, it'll be British North America. But the Spanish contri contributions really, um, uh, if you take a look at the Spanish um, uh, explorers here, you got De Leon. He explored what we now call Florida. And actually, they even established, and I got my, my points here probably a little out of order here, St. Augustine, Florida in 1565, which is the oldest European city in North America. Uh, that's even still in existence. You can go to St. Augustine today. They have a historical area and some replicas of what the original fort may have looked like and that kind of stuff. And once in a while, they even find old coins and stuff like that from the Spanish occupation. But we have De Soto. He explored uh, what we would today call southern, southwest United States. Uh, he's the one that ran into uh, what was uh, the, re the remains of the cliff dwellers, the Pueblonians. Um, there in New Mexico and, and Colorado. And he explored, of course, northern Mexico and all, and, and all of those areas. You also have, um, uh, of course, uh, down in Mexico City, we have Cortez who conquered Mexico and the Incas, but we're not going to go that far south with our study in this particular class. Now, keep in mind, Spain did uh, primarily sought to extract wealth from their colonial endeavors, particularly in the early stages of the colonization. Uh, France, on the other hand, when they came to North America, which they predominantly was up in what we'd call Canada, they weren't there so much to colonize, but to trade and trap fur. They wanted to trade with the natives, and they wanted to trap fur with the, um, with the natives up there. And their Catholic priests, they approached their, which they were from a different, uh, different sect of Catholicism, their approach was more of accommodation, not subjugation. Uh, unlike the priests down in South and Central America, they were ex they, the natives were expected to comply with Christianity, with the teachings of the church, and leave all their pagan ways behind, whereas the French accommodated their pagan ways. And so the French were much more accepted in, in their... Um, uh, in their trading endeavors than uh, the Spanish were or even the English. The English came to settle and uh, transport English ways and civilization into the New World. So again, why was this going on? Well, there's, like I said before, there's a few things. First of all, we've got the mercantilism that's happening. It's the dominant political economy of major European powers for about 200 years. Uh, you also have heavily regulated economy that required a positive trade balance. We talked about that all, all already. If you have to buy something from France or for some, some other country, then you're going to have to, uh, as a government system, find something that that country wants to buy from you so you end up at least breaking even on the trade balances. And boy, it sounds like my uh, uh, email is going off right and left here. Uh, so we'll keep going though. We also have these bubbles that start occurring and that's with these land speculations. So when, if, you're, if you have the money to come over and, and settle large chunks of land, we're talking miles and miles, and you think a colony is going to end up coming here and, and your mother country is going to want to settle, then you could basically stake claim to that land and then sell it with the hopes of it becoming something. Now, here's the other thing to that, is if you're the first mercan, uh, mercantile business there and you set up a grocery store, you know, what, what would be considered a grocery store then, but set up business and you're the only one there, guess what? You get to charge whatever price you want because you're the only game in town. 
And that happened quite a bit. We'd, today we'd call that a monopoly. So, and again, part of the mercantilism, I got my PowerPoint here just a little bit out of order here, required colonies to produce raw materials and precious metals, so, uh, and then they'd have to send them back to the mother country where they would be produced into uh, finished products. And as a result of this, it did cause frequent wars uh, between the different clo uh, the European powers. There was a time period, there was, uh, if you ever want to do a little interesting research, look up the tulip wars. There was a time period when, when tulips actually caused wars between the European powers. At one time, the Dutch Empire was the tulip uh, resource of the world. And they, they, there was particular colors that they would go, go, literally go to war over. Uh, the tulip wars did not last very long, and the tulip being the effect... They, tulips were worth more than money at one time. And so, uh, again, that was a short time period, but uh, the Dutch really had the market on that for a while, and then it disappeared. Uh, the, the, the thrill of tulips was no longer uh, driving the economy. <clears throat> so we also, like I said before, we had the centralization of power. Uh, monarchs, uh, again, started uh, so, uh, solidifying their power. Uh, which, of course, added to their prestige. The bigger the empire, the more prestige they had, and, of course, the more availability that they were able to uh, uh, gather resources for. Now, what's interesting here is the English political tradition was, was dictated very differently in the American English colonies. And you're going to see that, particularly when we get into uh, the, uh, the founding era or what leads to the founding era, uh, post the French and Indian War. But because of how the Americas had to operate, because of its long distance from the mother country, about three month journey on, in, in bad weather or maybe even six weeks in good weather, a long distance, there's no cell phones, there's no Snapchat, uh, to send a message could take six months or more to get a reply message. So they had to operate very differently than the other European countries who also didn't have those communications, the modern communications. But in a lot of ways, as uh, William Graham Sumner wrote in 1899, Spain was the first of a long time. Well, let me rephrase that. I'm not quite reading that right. Spain was the first for a long time, the greatest of the modern imperialistic states. The United States, by its historical origin, its traditions, and its principles, is the chief representative of the revolt and reaction against that kind of state. For a long time, we, were, we rejected the idea of being an imperialistic state, of imposing our will on other people in other lands. Now, that does change in American history, particularly in, well, you got the... Uh, uh, early 1800s with the Mexican-American War, where we really start raising our head up to start sniffing around in, uh, in, in regards of colonialization with imperialistic ideals, but it's not until the 1890s before it really kicks off, and in many, many people see that we are still an imperialistic country now, um, but we'll get there uh, and discuss that further in degree B class. So that's it for the background of colonialization. We will start with Virginia and the Cavaliers in the next slides. <laughs>